Okay, well, hello, John Monroe here uh, with Movements and Mobility. I'm here in the Greifekeets neighborhood uh, in Kreuzberg in Berlin, uh, and I'm here speaking with uh, Theresa Pfaff and uh, Victoria Scheidler, who are uh, researchers. I'll let them introduce themselves, and we're going to talk a bit about some kind of mobility politics in this neighborhood. Okay, hi. Thanks for having us, John. <laughs> um, I'm Theresa. I'm a research associate uh, at the Berlin Social Science Center. Um, my research group is called Digital Mobilities, and our main topics are around the transformation of mobility and the transport, um, the change of transport modes for people, and the change of how we use our streets. Yeah, thanks also for me, John. Yeah, I'm Victoria. I'm also basically like Theresa, research associate at the Berlin Social Science Centre and in the same group. And yeah, we both work in the project uh, Kreffi Keeps, which yeah, we are here to talk about today. Excellent. Okay, great. And I should say thank you too. You two have been so generous giving <laughs> your time to host me and, and show me around. Okay, great. So not everybody knows about the Griffith Keats neighborhood. Can you tell us a little bit just in general, kind of where are we and how do you characterize this part of Berlin? Mm, I can start. Um, yeah, so we're in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, like one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest districts in uh, Berlin. And yeah, so this is the neighborhood like Griffith Keats, like the northern part of it, where the project um, is taking place. And what's interesting here is also that. Um, there is a very, like, very low, very low car ownership in comparison to Berlin, but also in comparison to Germany as such. Yeah, yeah and we have basically this area. There's been lots of changes to how the street is used. Like, there's been a, always, like, since the 80s, there's been um, a Verkehrsberuhigung, which means that you have to slow down when you drive through here and it's meant the streets are meant to be used as a mixed area like people are used to, should be able to play here and cars should just drive slowly through it and so on and so forth but as we can see that's not really um, come through this regulation so Okay, so the two of you are involved in a, in a specific project. So this is an interesting neighborhood. Um, we have some existing examples here, this modal filter. And as you were just saying, there's obviously some thinking that's already been happening in this neighborhood over time about the relationship between the private car and public space. Um, so can you maybe, I can see that this is a modal, modal filter, but can you maybe locate this a little bit in this particular junction and then maybe we can move on to think of some examples of the project you're working on and what it's, and what it's doing. So, so what are we looking at here? Um, we are looking at um, the modal filter which is implemented here in order to prevent cars driving just through the area in order to shorten their trips because we have two main roads which are surrounding the Grefe Keats and people like lots of cars travel there and um, so this model filter is kind of preventing people to shorten their trips between the two roads that are kind of cornering around the Grefe Keats and it kind of helps also to um, slow down car traffic in the Grefe Keats so we have the cars turning around here and here and then they have to slow down obviously and that kind of really it's like one of the um, often used first instruments in order to kind of um, uh, limit car driving in inner city areas and we have lots of these model filters in Berlin and I think this was one of the first ones maybe not but I think it was one of the first ones and you can see like that bikes can go, still go through, pedestrians can still go through and it's a nice way of slowing down traffic. This is one of the pillars also this project is built on because it's the idea to like think about okay now we have this zone but like how can we make it more safe. Perfect. Well, that leads exactly to the next question that I want to ask. So obviously we're in a neighborhood and just standing here, it's very obvious, like this doesn't seem controversial. People are very used to it. People are moving through this area. There's flow. There are also cars that are moving slowly and occasionally through the area. Um, so clearly this is a neighborhood that you have something to, to start with. There already is some momentum in this direction. Mm -hmm. So what is Project Grafikeets and how does it, why is it about this neighborhood and how did it go from being what I understand is a research project to something that's having more practical implications. So can you walk me through what the project is and its sort of development and where it is now? Um, yeah. 
Well, Berlin or specifically Friesland Kreuzberg has always had the challenge how do we um, meet climate change and how do we make the city or the inner city more resilient towards climate change and um, and also how do we promote alternatives to the car and how to, do we like kind of heighten the life quality in the inner city. So. And the local municipality in Friesland Kreuzberg uh, they asked us in 2021 to do a study um, on how do pe people feel about their streets, um, about this, how the street is used and how it is um, um, kind of given to the cars or used for other purposes. And um, we did a study and we asked like around a thousand people in the district and um, did like a representative study and found out that lots of people would actually be open to change not in the sense that they don't want cars to drive through the streets anymore that that would be too radical we didn't have lots of um, positive feedback on that but when it comes to maybe limiting parking spaces they were open to towards that idea so the lo local municipality took these results and thought of a concept and thought of maybe we can try it in the Griffe Kids because what has happened here already and there's like uh, Victoria said earlier we have um, little car um, use here and little car uh, like people owning cars is very less here, little here. Um, so we could try it here and maybe have less resistance um, and they actually in the first place the project was much bigger and they wanted to uh, take away 2,000 parking spots and the local municipality or the local um, political body they voted on that and they agreed on it and that was a concept taken back to the local municipality yes you can go through and and do it in the graphic kids and get away uh, take away 2,000 parking spots um, at the end of the day that's a bit too radical and the local municipality checked like the law um, requirements and so on and that's you know, it's difficult to kind of um, implement this kind of change so radically. So they could get sued and it would be really um, difficult to implement change here. And it would just like slow down the whole process. Um, so they turned it down in order for it to really be a tryout. A tryout of six months and we are now looking at, I think, 400 parking spots that are limited and taken away. And it's also a better project to try it with 400 parking spots because people can maybe get used to it, have an idea of how it looks like, how the streets can be used and kind of get a feel for it and it's not such a radical change. And you also, I mean, you do want change and you do want maybe for people to use alternatives to their cars, but you can't take away like parking spots just straight away. People need alternatives for their cars. So there's like the main part of this project is also like a parking garage close by and um, people can rent a place there and kind of use it for their cars and um, that's a good substitution and what the main project from the local municipality is as well is they actually um, in order to to react towards climate change they are taking away the stone like you know the streets the road the, the um, what you call it um, hmm? asphalt or concrete or yeah yeah like they're taking out the stones we're going to look at it just okay, now yeah. um, in order for urban heating yeah. to slow down and um, parking spaces are quite a good way of taking this area and making cities more resilient by taking out the concrete and making it less hot and being able to heat up yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. And as I understand, more absorbent when it rains as yeah, well, exactly, right? Yeah, so for exactly. flood and drought, yeah. if, you, if you will, yeah. it's uh, yeah, less less parking is better yeah. for that. So that's interesting. So this is a really great example. Like you know, as a as an academic myself, this basically never happens in my world, or at least maybe other people I know, but never to me. You've been working on this research project and thinking of con you know conceptualizing this stuff, and here you are with real traction bringing it into uh, existence and 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 letting the ideas letting letting it see letting us see how the ideas look in in practice so that's that's quite exciting um, the consultation part is interesting too because you're right like you can't just impose these changes regardless 
but it's also interesting how consultation works with these things. I don't ever remember anyone ever being consulted about car dominated streets. You know, those are just put in because that was seen as a public necessity or what have you. But doing something different does require extensive consultation all along the way. Um, and I'm sure that's, as you're saying, that's very much something that it sounds like you've, you've experienced. So let me ask you one more question before we look at some of the, the concrete, as it were, examples of, of what you're doing here. So Teresa, you said how this connects to climate change. I was hoping that, that maybe either of you could say a little bit more about that because that's obviously the, the issue of our times in many ways. Um, and what you're doing here is you're working on a quite local kind of set of infrastructural changes or possibilities. How do you see that? Like, I can imagine ways in which these are connected, but I'd like to hear you say a bit about it. What, what do you see as the connection between what you're doing here and the global climate crisis that we find ourselves in? Um, so maybe on like the car level, I mean, in, like scientific research uh, has pointed out for a long time that like reducing parking spots or, or having like privileges for like being parking spots at least being a privilege and also like not helping obviously to reduce car ownership and reducing like the kilometers we like drive the car with. Um, so the idea is, like uh, the hypothesis, if you take away parking spots, it changes mobility, the mobility of people, and thereby also reduces car ownership and reduces CO2 emission. And but then, like on the like city level, um, as Teresa said before, like taking away the, like the stones and the concrete, like in German it's called Entsiegelung, and basically filling up. Uh, parts of these areas with uh, soil and with like people can like from people from like the neighborhood can come and garden and like put in like plants like um, plants that are like really into heat and so on and um, it also changes the city climate and um, yeah makes it more like reduces the heat also within the streets. Okay. Yeah. So it's a very you know achievable set of local kinds of things that do have that connect directly up and it and it, hopefully it enables people to feel like a sense of agency around this because I know one thing I think we all feel about the climate crisis is oh god who could ever do anything about that it's so overwhelming and the work that you're doing is a way to answer that and say no actually there are things that are happening right here so can we take a look at some of the at some of the more specific kind of things that are that are happening here yes. let's do it okay well so we've moved over a little bit here um, and as I was saying to you as we were just walking over, I'm always concerned this camera has quite weak volume, so I'm always worried it's gonna pick up our voices. But one thing that's very noticeable in this street is just, and it's a street that cars are allowed and there goes one, but it's a street that's very quiet by, by standards of, of most streets in, in contemporary cities. So I'll just, I'll just note that as we, as we stand here. Now, we're standing next to what to me looks like a bit of a construction site. I'm not clear what's going on, but this is obviously, you brought us here to show us something about the project in action. What are we looking at here? Um, we are basically looking at what's about to happen here. Um, these used to be uh, parking spaces and there's um, lots of different areas now in this street and another street going this way um, where we were just now. Um, and they are taking away the stones in order to make like um, basically lawn areas. Yeah. And what's specific or, or special in this street is there's a school and there's different kindergartens here and so on. And this area is supposed to be used by them as well. Like there's going to be like a green classroom which will be over there. Um, and here there's going to be like these, um, they're called parklets. I'm sure it's yes. like a, yeah. Um, they're supposed to be built here as well for like the kindergartens um, to be able to play and use the road in a different way instead of just as a parking spot. So this is really deconstructing a parking spot and how far it can be used and also kind of um, empowering like the local people here to be able to use this road space again. And this is like really the beginning of it so um, it still looks a bit rough. <laughs> But that's what I love about what we're looking at here, is this is a space, um, it, this clearly, you know, it's not hard to picture a whole bunch of cars parked. Well, I mean, that's the other thing, right, is the efficiency of the use of space with cars. It wouldn't even, it's probably not that many parking spaces have been removed here, but what you can do by removing a few spaces is open up like a 
lot of possibility for a lot of different kinds of uh, options exactly. here. Yeah, maybe also then to add on what Teresa just said, I think that's what we've not touched upon so far, is that like not all the spaces basically are like dug up and um, like gardens will happen here or like lawns, but like some of the spaces are just also left open for um, people who live here, for the neighborhood to like take ownership of them and decide themselves what they want to do on their street and like yeah what what they want their neighborhood to look like so there's like a whole kind of like participation process going alongside the project um, with project partners of ours who like talk to the people and um, basically help them to yeah, take ownership of uh, the other parking spaces that are then still left open amazing <laughs> well this is very inspiring to see should we take a look and stroll a little bit and see what else mm -hmm. we can find like a change uh, parking spot for quite a while now you also see here it's quite it's quite worn away already and um, this is actually a parking spot for uh, cargo bikes okay and there is also sometimes a cargo bike which you can use yeah. for like a few hours and yeah. yeah so this is just like an example of how it might look but it's going to be a bit more organized and uh, implemented here and the greater kids as well yeah yeah well also looking at this it calls to mind the, the idea that like you know these e-bikes and obviously regular bikes I mean just the basic principle that you don't need a driver's license and you certainly don't need to own a car to be able to access these yeah. so your mobility can go from perhaps walking to wheeled transport yeah. without needing to have a, the ex an expensive vehicle of a car and so for me that also speaks to the ways that the kind of project that you're working on and the larger conversation that it's part of is connected to just basic issues of social justice um, and I'd love to hear you say a bit more about that. It, sometimes I think it's easy to picture the class dimension. If you can't afford a car, then that is a barrier to being able to move through your city if your city's only designed for people who own cars. Um, but also I'm wondering if they're, you know, what's the feminist analysis of what we're looking at here? What is the way that age is a relevant kind of uh, identity characteristic for thinking about the street? How does race matter to thinking about the ways that cities are organized in terms of this project here? So, so what do you think about this? Is this a social justice project or not? Or how does that connect? Um, yeah, that's, a, uh, that's an approach that we are definitely looking at because car dependency is a class problem. And we have people who are car dependent that have to pay much more from the salary towards this car dependency than others. And here we have also different income classes in this area which we have to look at and, and also the, um, um, the people who have shops here as well like what's, what, is, what are their conditions, you know, what happens to their businesses if parking is taken away and I mean lots of studies show that often um, their profits kind of increase when um, areas are more attractive but then also maybe rents increase so we have lots of dynamics that we have to look at and when it comes to our research that is accompanying this project uh, we try to look at different groups that need to be included and represented in our research because we often find that certain groups are not their perspectives kind of don't fall into the research or, or don't go into the research and we're trying to change or close these gaps and maybe you want to say more about that because it's your... I can try. Yeah, yeah but basically you're, you already said it quite well. Um, I think that when we look at like the science or also the, like the practical, like what happens in like praxis, like in practice, um, in like mobility, like in the mobility transition, it often like we often see that it's always the same people who come and who are engaged and they're often very like yeah often like people who are mobile people who also like have like a decent salary and who can actually take the time and capacity to think to rethink the location so but that also means that certain like perspectives just fall under the table so in our project like from the research perspective um, we have so-called focus groups for example um, so group discussions with uh, different groups of people in the area so for example people who um, own shops here because they're obviously very strongly affected and they um, 
are also very critical about projects like these because they're also scared of like their income and um, their shop. But then, for example, also uh, groups with uh, people who um, are kind of restricted in their mobility. So I mean, this is a very big range. Um, for now, we're trying to focus on like people with disabilities and. Um, for example, like elderly people, because there is also for just over there, like this um, elder, an elderly home, or like also like apartments for elderly people who need aid who can't live by themselves anymore at all. And like it's important to also hear their perspective. Um, but they usually like it's it's shown that people then don't come to, for example. Um, how to say like um, other events so much because maybe they're just not that accessible so it's important to reach out to them specifically. That's so important. Um, can you say a little bit more about how that outreach looks because I think that's just such a valuable point about the perspectives that are included and not included in this conversation and that's all about power in all the different ways it seems and it's also like for people who like yourselves who are doing this work it's it's not just unfair it's also sort of unscientific to use a term because you're leaving out what might be the most insightful perspectives it's not just any old perspectives it might be the perspectives that have the, the most insightful kind of points to make um, and they're just not so often heard because they're not located in the places of, of the most power so to your point how then do you, how does that work in praxis? How do you engage with people who, if you recognize constituencies that you don't think you're hearing more from, what, what advice do you have for people that, that are thinking about including voices that are not always heard? Um, I think that's a very, very good question, a very valid point, because you can really see how different, different ways of outreach um, only reach very specific groups of people. And um, so what we 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 did um, in this project, we tried to at first like create like a stakeholder map and see like who um, like who lives here, like what are the different organizations, like for example, locate all the different like elderly homes or like the neighborhood uh, community um, like community spaces, and then just find like talk to them and actually ask them like, hey, what's the situation in the in the neighborhood? and what kind of ways do you think reach people who usually are kind of like just fall under the radar and um, basically then what we did for the focus groups now um, they're just starting so we also have to see how it like um, how it turns out is really just like address like these like i think in multiplicator like multipliers like talk to these like the people in um, in the neighborhood who then have contacts and who then again talk to other people um, and who also invite us to formats that already exist so for example like uh, kids breakfast like neighborhood breakfast where we can just come and just talk to the people there and see like who might actually be interested um, we did like a flyer action so we put flyers on every or almost every because it's very it's a big neighborhood like almost every um, door in the in the streets um, obviously like the usual like online social media and so on but these I think sometimes just very reach very specific people but yeah I think these two means of outreach and communication just really go there talk to people and make it as accessible and easy as possible mm. and then maybe to add to, add, um, to that mm -hmm. it's just that another group that we also specifically look at is school children because this is uh, this road and where the project is kind of going down is there are two to three schools yeah. and we have research partners that specifically look at that group and have um, school children walk around and they do like walking interviews and kind of ask them so how do you feel on the street and uh, what would you like to change? How safe do you feel here? And that's a really nice way of getting in touch with this group because um, they have like a different perspective and they are really concerned when it comes to road safety here because the car parking kind of, um, makes it harder to see them or um, yeah, they make it, it makes it less nice for them to be here after school. Um, so our research partners are looking into that, which is also quite nice because we have another focus on another social group um, mm -hmm. in addition to the other focus groups. Um. Wow, I'm, I just have to say, I'm just so, 
impressed by this because it's so rare to have like that kind of degree of like outreach that's thinking about all the levels of power and to think about age as a kind of category of analysis of power when looking at this stuff is something we can maybe conceptualize but like here you are doing it it's just it's just really nice to see Okay, so this is interesting. It looks like not everybody is completely on board with the project that you're working on here. Um, can you tell me what we're looking at here? And maybe if you could say a little bit more broadly, why do you think this issue, and of course not just here in city after city, why is it so contentious to remove a few parking spaces or to rethink the place of the car in the city? What is this and, and how does it connect? Do you want to say? Yeah, so as you see, there is like one graffiti but there's not only one there's multiple graffitis just in this area that are really like opposing the project and um, yeah also like yeah the municipality's decision and um, yeah so I mean maybe to come back to your second or to your question I mean obviously taking away parking spaces um, is something completely different for people being used to owning a car, having the freedom of parking it everywhere, um, going around with it, um, and yeah, for like I think on the one hand, it's it's kind of scary to take like to yeah having to think about like um, it? yeah like having to having to think about this uh, changing in a way. Um, but yeah, we were just talking before, I think it's not only about the parking spaces and um, I think it's also to do with like what it does to the neighborhood in a way. For example, this is already a very um, touristy neighborhood and obviously already quite a gentrified neighborhood and um, I think it scares people like um, this, yeah, seeing these changes and um, maybe like um, to say it in English, like Aufwertung, to um, yeah, changing the neighborhood to making it like more beautiful, having more green there, and maybe also attracting more tourists, and then again like increasing rents and so on. I think it's, I mean, it's a valid point. It uh, can also be terrifying to think about like maybe you can't afford this apartment anymore because the neighborhood's just changing to the advantage of um, yeah more privileged people. Um, yeah, well, we kind of have, I think maybe the issue is, um, we call it in science, we often call it the NIMBY um, protests, like not in my backyard protests. And what I find interesting here is, this is like a public street place, space, you know, and people are concerned that um, something is taken away from them, which is actually not owned by them, but it's in front of their place where they live. So they should have a say. Um, but it's interesting that they are so used to being able to park and put their private property on a public space and taking that for granted. I think it's really hard to imagine that to be changed. Um, and what Victoria said that they are worried about increase of noise and we kind of have forgotten about how loud cars actually are and we are so used to certain things that are also questionable and um, I think change is always difficult. And then again, we also have this, um, I feel that some people here don't really accept the political institutions that are making these decisions, right. that have been voted for and that are like a legit legitimate um, body yeah. of um, power, I, yeah. we would say in our democratic um, um, world, but yeah, some people don't accept that or, or don't feel that it's... Um, done right here and that they have been like kind of overpowered and have had no say in what's going to happen here and they, they are worried about that and it's interesting for us as researchers especially as social scientists to see how this political body doesn't seem to uh, be legit for these people yeah yeah because we do have elections and you are as a as a local person here you're allowed to go to these um meetings that they have where they vote for these kind of things and they feel overpowered and they feel like um, something someone is like kind of like a parent telling them what to do and this is 
specifically interesting if we are saying this is a public street space and like you said earlier no one asked us if we want them to be parked filled with cars or yeah. uh, you know like and nobody asked um, if we want I don't know the slam to stand there but yeah. now it's getting really intense when it comes to these democratic processes and yeah, yeah. What's it hmm? What's it say? yeah yeah can you tell us actually can you just translate this for us I know what the first six letters are. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it says Fuck WZB and Rot Grün, kein Parkverbot im Kiez. So, Fuck WZB, it's the Berlin Social Science Center, and Rot Grün, like red green, like yeah. the uh, political parties who are in charge of this municipality. And kein Parkverbot im Kiez means uh, no parking restrictions in the neighborhood. Yeah. So, in terms of pushback then, I mean, that's also interesting. There's legitimate concerns, and then there's kind of less legitimate concerns, and those, that is a mix of that that's part of the pushback, right? So also, like, with movements and mobility, what we're also interested in are the ways that social movements are pushing for the very kinds of changes that you're bringing about and the very ways of reconfiguring power in public space that a project like this directly speaks to. So is there a way, and that just seems so important in this neighborhood in particular because there's such a rich history of all kinds of social movements and quite militant ones as well. So is there a connection there? Is there, is there a way that kind of progressive social movements that are challenging power are also speaking to this issue? Is that, is that part of the conversation here? Um, well, we have the so-called Grefe Kids Forum, um, which is a group of local people that have been organizing themselves for quite a while. I'm not sure how long, but we're also in touch with them as a strong group of stakeholders in this area. And they uh, always worked on something called the Kids Block, mm -hmm. which is uh, similar or inspired by the super blocks in Barcelona oh, yeah. or the low traffic um, neighborhoods in London where you are more radical and you try to block out cars in like these squares mm -hmm. of areas yeah. and there has been like a bottom-up organization here that has been working on that being part of the Kids forum and i don't know i'm not sure it felt like that COVID and all these years kind of yes. pressing down on social movement groups mm -hmm. have also worked here mm -hmm. and yeah we also we get support from these kind of groups or the local municipality gets supported by them but um, yeah I think it's kind of toned down um, here when it comes to social movement groups yeah, yeah yeah interesting and I mean you would know much more about this than me but I think there's also been a way that like police engagement in different ways both kind of like soft power and more repressive power have maybe diminished the power of social movements in this neighborhood like going back a few decades now yeah. as well it could be part of it plus COVID of course it's general kind of dampening effect so it'll be interesting to see as things pick up again where that's all where that's all going to go okay one final question um, and thank you again so much for all of this conversation and, and showing me around here so, you know, this is a question here in the Grefekeets, it's a question in Berlin, but as everyone knows, this is a question in every city in the world, maybe at this point, or at least it's very much a transnational urban question. So, what advice do you, and here you are, do, you're actually, you know, on the job here doing this work. It's, it's just, again, so nice to see. What advice do you have for other cities that are thinking about engaging in this kind of work? <laughs> um, yeah have lots of time, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, have lots of nerves and maybe in the broader picture it's always important to get different stakeholders together I mean that's really the main thing. Yeah. We as researchers can't get a lot of things done because we can't just go and change the road obviously but we are good as actors in, in order to kind of evaluate the process and look out for inclusiveness and so on what we had earlier but I think the main aspect is really this it needs to be a network of different actors and working on this kind of stuff. You need local municipality, you need, the, you need the people living in the area, you need the social movement groups and you need um, researchers to be part of the process in order to bring in new ideas but also evaluate the process. And, um, yeah, I always like the idea that we kind of bridge inclusiveness by these focus groups as well. That's yeah. maybe one thing that I find important that you need to look at specific groups for um, certain local contexts and that's really important. 
Um, yeah, maybe you have more ideas. <laughs> no, I think you said it quite well. Like one or like two things that came to my mind. So yes, maybe I do have one more ideas. Um, it's like speak to the people. Just like really be present and um, yeah, just speak to the people and find out like what is actually going on and um, involve people who want to be involved and people who have difficulty speaking up. And like one thing for me, maybe also just personally, is this like I think it's so important also to learn from each other. So exactly what you're doing by, for example, recording these videos and showing different projects to connect like between the different projects because we often do similar things and we do it alongside each other. And I think it's so much more potent if we like um, connect and yeah, bridge our knowledge. And Excellent. Well, that's a nice place, I think, to, to bring to a <laughs>